loving God, as we encounter the pain of the cross and the earth-shattering power of the resurrection, help us to confess, Jesus is alive, alleluia. When we cannot see Jesus in the brokenness of our world, remind us, Jesus is alive, alleluia. When we feel discouraged and confused and our expe expectations are shattered, remind us, Jesus is alive, alleluia. When all hope is lost and we see death, remind us, Jesus is alive, alleluia. When all hope, uh, when we grieve with broken hearts, remind us, Jesus is alive, alleluia. When we hear Jesus call us by name, remind us, Jesus is alive, hallelujah. Jesus is alive and remains with us always. Amen, hallelujah. Let us pray. Holy Lord Jesus, on this day we rejoice in your glory and stand in awe of how you have transformed this world with your dying and your rising. Receive our joyful praise. Amen. Our reading today for Easter Sunday is from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are no, no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will give you the option today, because it's a little bit of a long reading. If you'd like to stand, you are able. Otherwise, you can sit. And I encourage you to close your eyes and picture what unfolds in the reading. Where, are, where is it? What does it look like? How do people speak? From John, the 20th chapter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in the place by itself. Then the other disciples who reached the tomb, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that, they must, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciple returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, 
Why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. May I bother someone for a stand? It got moved with all of this stuff that's changed on a Sunday morning. I don't mean to turn my back to you, but come and enjoy. So when I arrived at church today, uh, one of the people who were assisting at the 8 o'clock service said, so what do I have to do? I said, have fun. That's what this day is all about. And little did I know until I opened up the bulletin that was the leader's bulletin, I found out that the office had fun with me as they printed it upside down and right and left. And so it was pretty, <laughs> it was humorous. I had to uh, live by the words that uh, were, that I shared with the other. But here we are in Easter. Welcome home to those who have not been here. Welcome to those who have not uh, ever been to St. Luke's. What we are doing right now is we have children's church. So the kids go out and they have some fun. And they actually have a gift bag today with some Easter candy. So if kids still want to run and do that, or you can, you can listen to a talking head. Um, but um, Easter. It changed the world. It changed the world one life at a time. It changed this man. A man who thought he knew everything. He was so certain of his knowledge and beliefs that he looked down on others. So much so that those who didn't think and believe like him, he thought deserved to die. What would you do with such a person? Dismiss him? Avoid him? Would you want him arrested? Would you want him killed? He is the person who wrote our first reading. The Apostle Paul, who previously was known as Saul, a religious leader who was hunting down people who didn't believe and think like him and killing them. Just partway into the message, they're going to run away. Others can join them. Remember, we're all children of God. The Apostle Paul, who previously was known as Saul, a religious leader, hunted and persecuted and killed those who did not believe like he did. But what changed to make him write this letter? The risen Lord confronted him. The risen Lord came to him and they had a conversation. And Saul came to understand his ways and the way of Jesus. Jesus forgave him and then invited him to see the world as God intended it to be from the very beginning. For God is love. Love, godly love, is the ultimate assurance, stronger than logic, Love is not an idea to be worked out, but a fact. God is love. The unshakable evidence of God's love is seen as Paul had wrote earlier in the Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. 
We have Bibles in our pews. I encourage you to take one out and join in looking at Romans 5, 6 through 10. If you need to find it, it's a little trick here. You need to divide it in half. Divide it in half again, and you'll be closer to the New Testament, and you divide it in half again. You're in beyond the Gospels, and turn to page 147. Why didn't you say that in the first place, right? But 147 in the back of the hymnal, the New Testament, because Matthew starts one all over again. And find verse five, chapter 5, verse 6, bottom right-hand corner. Those of you who are at home, sorry, um, don't have a Bible for you there, but um, please find yours and join us. Because we need to hear these words to understand Paul's writing in chapter 4. It says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who did Christ die for? Not the perfect? Not the righteous? Not the chosen ones? Well, Paul writes that God died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. Go back up to verse 8. I invite us to read that together. If you take away anything from today's worship, take away this verse. Join me. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our first reading. Paul asked a series of rhetorical questions. Each is followed not by an answer to the question itself, but a statement that shows that the answer must be nobody. If God is for us, who is against us? Nobody. nobody. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Nobody. Who is to condemn? Nobody. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? God poured out through Jesus love of the most powerful and unbreakable kind. It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. <laughs> Even justice is not the last word about God. Love is the last word. Christian assurance is the very opposite of human arrogance. Christian assurance is humble. It's a trusting faith. The most powerful new religion in Turkey during Paul's lifetime was the cult of Caesar himself. The one who declared himself God and demanded that people worship him. I would argue that much is the same now in our secular world today. Factions of people claiming superiority over others there is no humility, except maybe false humility. And there is little faith in God, let alone others. How has that been going for us so far? Is that working? How do we change? Like Paul, to have our eyes open to the forgiveness and love of God Paul was welcomed in by those very people that he sought to kill. They opened their door to him. They healed him. And they taught him. They shared not only the gospel of Jesus Christ, but their very lives with him. That is what we strive to do here. All are welcome. St. Luke's is a welcoming and growing community of faith, busy making Christ known to the world. And we do that through our, living out our core values 
of service and worship, evangelism, community, stewardship, and discipleship. Things that you will find in that booklet that I showed earlier, 99 years and beyond. For the Christian faith is not to be personal or private. The Christian faith is not to be personal or private. It is meant to be shared. The risen Lord, his last words in Matthew are the Great Commission. Go therefore and teach all to come and know the love of God. Teaching them all that I commanded you. And that was command you to love one another. If this message were to catch on, the world would be turned upside down and a lot of vested interest with it. What gets in the way? Well, we do. Our own pride, our own prejudice, our own intellect. Sadly, much of the church has been co-opted, says N.T. Wright uh, in his commentary on the Romans. He says it offers an apparently spiritual version of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Western church is in danger of becoming so concerned with Christianity as a way to further its own self-advancement that it has forgotten what its siblings in many other countries know and live day by day. The true way to Christian joy lies in discovering and living out Jesus' message of acceptance, forgiveness, and love. Paul experienced it and then shared it with others. Paul speaks of God's love as the ultimate security, opening one's heart and life to the tidal wave of that love. It is the ultimate human fulfillment. But God's love, it's lost if it ends with you and me not fulfilling the Great Commission. It can only continue if it's shared. That is the only way it can grow. This powerful love grasped Paul, sustained him in his prayers, his preaching, his journey, his writing, his pastoring, and his suffering. With the strong sense in the permanence of God's love, it was put into action. Chapter 8 begins, Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To read it for your own benefit is selfishness. To read it as a directive is gospel. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if we are in Christ Jesus, that means we should have no condemnation toward anyone else. Only love. Only love that reaches out to the whole world and all people. Remember? It was for the weak. It was for the ungodly. It was for the sinners. It was everyone. All people. That is what we hear in the gospel. Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried, but rose again to new life. Life that is offered to us through his love. Life that is shared with others through our love of Jesus. Mary came expecting to experience death. Sadly, that's what lots of people think today, not knowing God and Christ, that we live this life and we die. When questioned by the two angels, she said through her tears, they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. For many of us, we look at the world today and we ask the same question, where is God? Where is Jesus? In the, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus warns his followers, many will tell you, there he is, or here is Jesus, but do not follow them. And then he told them, the kingdom of God will be among you. It'll be within you. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. That love that is offered. But in the Gospel of John, we don't hear those words. We actually see them lived out by Jesus himself. 
Remember? Mary's looking for him. He's the one who calls on her and calls her by name, Mary. In the weeks ahead, I invite you to come and hear stories of Jesus' other meetings. Jesus went through locked doors to those who were living in fear to offer them peace. Those who had gone back to what they had done before, he came to them and gave them a gift of abundance. To the one who doubted, he made a special trip to be with him, to show him his hands and his feet so that Thomas might believe. He forgave the one who denied him. And like Paul, he invited him to reach out to others. On this rock, I will build my church. These stories prove that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not our wandering, our fear, our doubt, our distance, our denial. There is no condemnation, only love. For each one of us is loved by God in Christ. For God proves his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That love is offered to you and to me, to everyone, and is made known as we share it with others, not only in words, but in our actions. It has been present in this community for over 99 years, even when those who came before us also wandered and feared and doubted and we argued with each other, and yet the Holy Spirit endures, and the message is shared in these walls to be then shared outside the walls. As people of God, that's what we are called to do. Forgive, not condemn or judge, but love. For nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.